Welcome to another movie plot. The film begins with a lady house hunting in New York after her recent breakup. She's taken to a 19th century brownstone on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in hopes that this will be the one. The realtors give Meg and her daughter a tour of the four-story luxury home, and point out that it's one of the only in the area to feature a lift as its previous owner was a wheelchair-bound millionaire. After touring the rest of the home the family are shown to a hidden panic room behind the main bedroom mirror. The safeguard against intruders has sensors to prevent hands being crushed and is fitted with security cameras connected to every room of the house. The recent divorcee finds the home a bit much for just herself and her daughter Sarah to live in all alone. Lydia reminds her that it's funded as part of Meg's divorce settlement and assures her that the home will sell quickly otherwise. Because of this the ladies move in right away and spend the night unpacking while eating takeout for dinner. When she puts her daughter to sleep Meg checks the diabetic smartwatch designed to track her blood sugar levels. After taking a bath with a bottle of wine to lament her recent split, Meg sets up the security cameras and attempts to wire the phone system but it's getting late and goes to sleep instead. That night a storm hits and a team of burglars exit a car out front and begin scoping out the house. After checking every possible entryway, one intruder makes his way inside silently through the fourth floor named Burnham. He realizes that the townhouse is occupied after entering both girls' bedrooms without them even noticing. Letting his partner inside, Burnham begins arguing with Junior about his lack of planning and failure to realize the house is already occupied. Junior's the grandson of the previous owner and has hired Burnham to help him get inside the panic room. He claims that there's $3 million in bonds still hidden inside it and has hired a third member Raul to assist, who Burnham doesn't like the look of as he's brought along a gun just looking for trouble. Junior eventually convinces him to continue the job with a reminder that he needs the money more than any of them. Meanwhile Meg wakes up to use the restroom as the trio begin to make their way upstairs. When she returns to her room she goes to turn the lights off and notices movement on the active security cameras. She runs to Sarah's room alerting the burglars to her awareness and after throwing a glass of water in her face they begin to get chased around the house. They make it to the elevator just avoiding Raul and descend past Junior, but Burnham refuses to harm them so Junior has to run back down to pick up the slack. Meg's able to then hit the button to return to the third floor and they just manage to make it inside the safe room before they're caught. The angry leader smashes the mirror and is calmly reminded by Raul that it's seven years of bad luck. With Meg's phone still outside under the bed, the girls have no way of contacting the authorities and instead use the intercom system to threaten the intruders, claiming to have already called the cops from inside the vault. Burnham however checks the system and makes it clear with hand gestures that he knows she's lying. The intruder spent the last 12 years working for the security company that installed the panic room and becomes dejected at the idea of having to find a way to crack it. He tells Junior that there's no way they can penetrate it and they'll need to convince the girls to unlock it instead. To prevent them from escaping the trio then seal up every exit around the house, when Burnham comes across the two morons attempting to tunnel into the room from below. He tells them that they'll never get through the three inches of steel surrounding the room but the new guy seems to think otherwise. When failing with that pointless endeavor the two see that Burnham's come up with a better idea. Since they won't come out on their own he attempts to force the ladies out using a propane tank and knocks out the side of the wall. He gains access to the panic room's air vents with the intention of pumping in just enough gas to make them feel sick. During this Junior just stands around like a spoilt rich kid while at least Raul helps with attaching a hose to the tank. It's not until they start actually pumping gas into the room does Junior realize what they're even doing, and pretends like he was about to suggest they do something just like this. Despite Burnham saying that too much will kill them, Raul begins to pump an excessive amount of gas into the room and the girls begin to struggle to breathe. Meg attempts to block off the vents with duct tape but the gas keeps coming in. As the crims are arguing between themselves about how much is too much, Meg finds a barbecue lighter among the clutter and the two cover up with fireproof blankets. Hearing the sound of the metal lighter clanging against the side of the vent, Junior presses his ear to the wall as the two with any brains back away. Meg sparks the lighter and the blast burns the side of Junior's face while filling the panic room with blue flames. The fire eventually recedes leaving Burnham to put the burning idiot out with only half of his face melted, which Raoul takes no blame for and tells Junior to give it a rest. Sometime later the supposed friends go downstairs to speak in private where the new guy demands an equal cut of whatever's inside the vault, which Junior agrees on until he instantly changes it to half. As they argue Sarah's blood sugar level begins to drop and she feels lightheaded, so she attempts to breathe through a fresh air vent and notices it peers into an apartment across the street. She searches the room and finds a flashlight which she uses to signal to the tenant for help. They get his attention so Meg and Sarah both try to scream for help, but with the storm draining out the sound he dismisses them and shuts his blinds. As the boys continue to argue Meg watches them from the surveillance cameras. 
The moment she sees the third intruder walk downstairs to squash the beef, Meg opens the door and makes a dash to her mobile phone, but knocks over the lamp on the nightstand in the process alerting the trio. They race back upstairs but Burnham's too late as he watches Meg dive into the panic room and Sarah reseal it. Noticing the empty charger Junior freaks out that they have a phone to call the police, but Burnham reminds them that Meg's still unable to dial out from inside the thick metal walls and needs a landline. Realizing this herself, Meg attempts to hardwire the safe room's emergency phone to the house line instead, which Burnham clues onto when he witnesses the extension pulled back inside the wall. She manages to reach the police but they put her on hold so instead calls her ex-husband. But his new girlfriend answers the phone and wastes everyone's time with her pointless questions like do you know what time it is? Meg's finally about to speak with him as Burnham fumbles to cut the connection, so Raul takes to the power lines with his sledgehammer ending the call. Feeling abandoned by him Sarah says that she's not convinced that her father would help anyway, and confesses that she's starting to feel hungry and dizzy. She watches on the cameras as Junior appears to be giving up on the mission. With the damage to his face and no way inside, he's feeling downtrodden and wants to go home. He tries to pay the boys off with a fraction of what he promised and brags about already having a million dollars in his bank, left to him as his inheritance by the same dead grandfather who owned the house. When the other two deduce by what he's saying that there's a lot more than $3 million in the panic room, Junior attempts to walk out on them when Raul shoots him in the back of the head. He double taps him and claims that neither of them know who he really is, as Junior only met him a couple of times before tonight. The psychotic hitman then prevents Burnham from leaving with the threat of execution, claiming later in the film that he kills anyone of any age for the same price. Just then someone walks into the house and is taken hostage to be held alongside Junior's corpse. He's Meg's ex-husband Steven and is discovered by his ID to be the leverage they need to get the girls to leave. Raul goes back to threatening Burnham as the idea man to come up with a solution by the time he counts to three, and when he reaches that fatal number Burnham lets out a shriek that he may have something. They take Steven to the panic room and prove his identity to Meg over the cameras, then begin to beat him up requesting that she open the door but the brave father shouts for her not to do it. The intruders begin to have another argument over how violent the hitman's getting and cover the camera before fighting. After a commotion to which Meg's blinded to see, Burnham walks back on screen dragging Raoul's unconscious body downstairs presumably winning. During the beating Sarah's blood sugar reaches a critical level and she begins to have a seizure. Needing to retrieve Sarah's medicine her mother leaves the panic room silently walking past an unconscious Stephen to retrieve it from the floor above. Burnham's plan works perfectly as Raoul used his balaclava to switch places with Stephen. The two finally make it inside the vault and see Sarah in a stable state but in need of her shots. The unstable Raoul decides to wait for Meg behind the bedroom door and taunts her that they now have her child. So knowing he's there she knocks him down unexpectedly and makes it to the panic room but runs into Burnham. She begins to struggle with the hitman who's slung into the room while the mother the bedroom, and when the sliding door closes the intruder's fingers are crushed and completely separated. Meg was able to throw Sarah's medicine pouch inside first and begs them over the intercom to administer it to her daughter. Raoul kneels riling in pain with the mother now armed with his dropped pistol on the outside. It's only when Burnham tells her to go downstairs does he agree to release his partner's fingers out of fear of her shooting them when the door opens. With his hand now wrapped up and his face exposed the hitman tells Sarah not to look at him, as Burnham uses the medicine pouch and follows the girl's directions to administer the injection. While she recovers Burnham explains to Sarah that he never meant to harm anyone and needed the money for his child. He then tells the mother over the intercom that her daughter's fine and begins to at last make his way inside the safe with his drill. Meg runs downstairs where she finds Stephen badly injured and props him up on his seat with the pistol and a lamp in hand to protect them. The doorbell suddenly rings and two police officers arrive that Stephen admits he called. Knowing they're watching over the camera, Meg's forced to answer the door acting as though she just woke and that Stephen's now asleep after making the call by mistake. Officer Keeney tells Meg that they're really responding to a neighbor's complaint about shouts coming from her home, so this guy actually came through. But Meg still lies to him and says that she just had a wild night with Stephen, so the smart officer suspects something more and tells her to blink if she's in trouble. She doesn't and continues to maintain the lie instead so the officers leave, as Raoul brings to Burnham's attention that the girl has seen both their faces and needs to die. Sarah knows this and takes a handful of syringes from the medkit for protection, before noticing that mom's going around with the sledgehammer knocking out all the cameras. Seeing this Raoul remarks to Burnham that why didn't they think of doing this themselves when they were downstairs. The safecracker eventually gets the treasure chest open to his moronic partner's horror when he finds it empty, but it's just a false floor hiding the treasure that didn't fool Burnham. He removes 22 bonds all worth a million each and secures them on his person. Before they can escape, Meg runs around the house making the place ready for an ambush. 
Burnham attempts to leave as the hitman takes Sarah as a hostage and they make their way downstairs, alerting Meg to their location with the shattered mirror she prepared as a makeshift alarm. When they reach the bottom they come face to face with Stephen but he only has a clear shot at Burnham. Raul refuses to release his meat shield but has no weapon, so mom comes at him from a door behind with a sledge to the face sending him tumbling over the balcony and breaking his leg. Burnham runs outside with the bearer bonds and even makes it to the fence line, when he hears the girls begin to scream. Raul's still coming for them as the weak Steven misses every shot and gets tackled to the ground dropping the pistol. He's unable to retrieve it as the intruder turns his attention back to Meg. Sarah uses the syringes and jumps on his back stabbing him in the neck over and over, but Raul punches the minor annoyance back into the fireplace. Grabbing his sledgehammer the hitman begins to lift it above his head to crush Meg's skull, but a bullet flies out his eye as Burnham's return to save them with Raul's own gun. With that psycho dead he tells the family that they'll be alright now and takes off running as police enter the building. Reaching the fence line once again he's suddenly surrounded by the authorities and is forced at gunpoint to raise his arms. He does so and when asked to drop what's in his hands, the $22 million worth of paper blows away and is destroyed in the storm. Despite being arrested Burnham spent the entire film trying not to harm anyone and actively putting himself in harm's way to protect Sarah. The family all survive albeit a little shaken up and we fade out to a short time later, as the ladies sit on a park bench together covered in bruises and searching for a new place to live in. And the movie ends. <laughs>